everyone. Welcome to today's Tuesday Times Roundtable. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, um, Abdi Javazadeh, who is an adjunct professor uh, of sociology. He currently teaches at FIU um, for both the Honors College and Labor Studies. Um, Abdi received his PhD here at FIU and earned his bachelor's um, and master's degrees from FAU. Originally from Iran, Javazadeh came to the U.S. in 1976, where he studied and later worked as an engineer. He later returned to college to earn his sociology degrees. He's the author of Iranian Irony, Marxists Becoming Muslims, a study of how Marxist political activists became integrated into Iran's 1979 revolution. He's taught here at FIU since 2000 in many courses, including sociology of terrorism, political sociology, social theory, social deviancy, so, as well as sociologies of the Middle East and of sexuality. He's also lectured at St. Thomas and UM. Uh, he teaches an upper division course titled Religion, Terrorism, and Society. He's also, I think, safe to say at this point, a Tuesday Times Roundtable veteran. This is his third Tuesday Times Roundtable, and uh, I, quite, I quite enjoy his talk. So take it away, Abdi. Hi, everybody. Um, so today, uh, especially since there's some terminology that I want you to be familiar with as I go through the talk, uh, I chose to have sort of a PowerPoint for you. And the PowerPoint and my talk go from a philosophical, conceptual, theoretical manner all the way down to the on the ground and factual manner. And then at the end, I will conclude for you. Now, the reason why I call my talk or I've written a paper on this that's getting published by Sage Publication, and um, it's turned out to be quite controversial uh, because I called American foreign policy uh, right out there a failure. And I call it a failure not because I feel it's failing, but if you look at the American foreign policy for the past 50 years, since the 1950s, which was the first time we sent about 15,000 troops to Lebanon um, and stationed them there, it's been failing. And it's failing because every time you look at the Middle East, whether it's in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and today, you'll see that we're still caught with some kind of a quagmire in the Middle East, and there's still conflicts coming up. There's a whole lot of violence. And it seems like we can't do anything about it. And what we need to do is actually be more present in the Middle East. Uh, I use the idea of Pyrrhic victory. I don't know if you know what Pyrrhic victory is, but uh, it's used in political science, and that's to win a battle or war, but at the same time lose everything. So you may gain the territory when you go to war, but at the same time you lose a whole lot of men, a whole lot of equipment, uh, a whole lot of money, and so on. So that kind of victory in political science is called Pyrrhic victory. I have turned that concept around, and mind you, this is not my original concept. Uh, Jeffrey Raymond, who teaches philosophy and criminology at American University, used this concept, uh, Pyrrhic, vic Pyrrhic, Pyrrhic defeat, uh, in order to explain and define uh, the American criminal justice system. But I've taken that concept and I've used it in the American foreign policy. Pyrrhic defeat is victory through loss or success through failure, which means while it looks like we're losing in the Middle East in this case, we're actually winning. And I'll tell you how it is that I think that we're winning or we're victorious through this failing 50, 60 year uh, failing process. Now. Many people think of this. I've, rep I've presented this paper, this concept, in a couple of different conferences. Uh, colleagues, people that think like me or write in the same realm as I do, think that it sounds like a conspiracy, that the US has conspired to fail in the Middle East, so therefore justifying its presence in the Middle East. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a conspiracy. I'm talking about a consistency. So if we have consistently failed in the Middle East and have come to embark upon this idea that, wait, the reason we're here still after 50 years, after 60 years, is because we've been failing. So why not continue that, that, kind, of a, that kind of a policy? And I have plenty of uh, data to show you how this, this concept works. 
this is a quotation from Gabriel Kelko. Unfortunately, he died a couple of years ago. But he wrote a book called The Century of War. And his, he wrote about war quite often. Um, in it, he says, same policies, this is the American foreign policy, same policies that to varying degrees have produced disasters for the US are still considered the only way to relate to the continuous and growing problems of a world that was already far too complex for it to manage 50 years ago. So what we started with as foreign policy in the Middle East 50 years ago still holds true. So you notice every time there's problems, there's violence, there's conflict, whether it's within the population, whether it's the population against the government, whether it's governments against each other, what have you in the Middle East, our solution is more militarism. Uh, we have the most concentrated numbers of American military bases right there in the Middle East. Before 9-11, we had 67 military bases in the Gulf region only, just the Gulf region, not all of the Middle East. Today, we have close to 127 of those military bases. So failure allows us to remain there even further. I've used the concepts of, these are two very famous conflict theorists, sociologists, Zimmel and Kozer. Uh, and according to this idea, conflict with an out-group creates an in-group cohesion. You'll see that uh, during the Cold War, up until 1991-1992, when the Cold War ended, what put us together, politically speaking, vis-a-vis -vis the other, was the Soviets and the socialist camp, and you know that kind of a that kind of a concept. After that, with the collapse of the Soviets and and socialism, so-called. Uh, we came up with this idea of terrorism, and you'll see, you'll see. Go read the newspapers, go read the books. Right there, when in 1992, when the Cold War ended, terrorism, ter terrorism picked up. Uh, Webster, who was the FBI director, at one point said, this is 1992, he said that he's not really happy with the collapse of the Soviets, because now the FBI doesn't know how to justify a lot of its policies. Also, the CIA didn't know how to justify a lot of its policies. So the threat of communism during almost 50 years of Cold War and more currently, terrorism have both served to create cohesion and solidarity in the US in the face of powerful, sometimes mysterious enemy. I'll talk about this mysterious concept of the Middle East. Middle East, every time you look at it, it's supposed to look like a place where people don't know what to do. They don't even know their history. It looks very mysterious and exotic. And we actually contribute to that a lot. Um, I'll give you some, um, some instances that you would see on mainstream media. And it, it looks like we need to go to their aid. Zimmel uh, said that a state of conflict, however, pulls the members to so tightly together and subjects them to such uniform impulse that they either must get completely along with or completely repel one another. This is the reason why war with the outside is sometimes the last chance for a state ridden with inner antagonisms to overcome these antagonisms or else to break up definitely. If you read the century for uh, the time, let me remember, the, um, the new American century, which was built in uh, 1997, it says in there, this is uh, the ideologues of the Bush administration, said that we need a disaster in order to justify a whole lot of our militarism around the world. And that's exactly what happened after 9-11. Uh, in the words of Tom Nairn, Armageddon has been replaced by ethnic abyss. Armageddon being the Soviet problem, if there is nuclear war, there will be Armageddon. That ended, and we picked up with the ethnic abyss. Ethnically, we don't understand the Muslims and the Arabs. Ethnically, they're always in it at, e at each other all the time. We can't explain it. I heard an NPR reporter say once in one of the reports where he was reporting from, I think it was from Iraq, he said this. He said, every time I look into the policies of the Middle East, it, I feel like I'm looking into a big black box, meaning I can't figure anything out. And this mysterious, the not knowing and the, the puzzling it and, 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 and exotic uh, Middle East is something that it's always reported on. Uh, people are very anti-modern. Um, they're Shia Sunnis, fanatics, fundamentalists, violent, militant, heavily armed, 
anti-modernity, and non-civilized. And they don't even actually understand what civilization is. And so therefore, we have to bring it to them. I've also used the concept of Orientalism. I'm not sure how many of you are, are familiar with Orientalism and Orientalist thought. This was originally thought of by Edward Said, a very big philosopher and sociologist who wrote about the Middle East quite a lot. Um, in it, he argues that Orientalism is the mystifying of the Orient, so in our case, the Middle East. So these people don't even know their history. We have to teach them their history. They don't understand modernity. We have to bring modernity to them. And even the people over there have come to hegemonically believe in Orientalism. So you, it could be that if you talk to a lot of Middle Easterners, they say the only way that we could become free and, and, and embark upon democracy and have some kind of an equality, uh, something that works, we need the West to come over here and teach us. So it's hegemonic. The argument is not that people in the Middle East don't believe Orientalism. They believe in it as well as we do. And the idea is that we have to effectively teach them. That's, that's the fundamentals of Orientalism. So I've, I've got some quotations by some really famous people. General Zinni said, Arabs are a people obsessed by injustice. And then Richard Larry said from the National Review, I don't know if you know, but it's a, quite a conservative um, publication. The line seems pretty clear. Developing mass commercial aviation and soaring skyscra skyscrapers was the West's ideas Slashing the throats of stewardesses and flying the planes into sky, skyscrapers was radical Islam's idea. Again, another uh, point of view from Orientalism. So this is the concept of Orientalism. Middle East as exotic, mysterious, enigmatic, irrational, sinister, barbaric, undemocratic, dark, and anti-modernization with men who shout out uh, and wave either their fist or Kalashnikov in the air, and powerless women who are covered from head to toe, who cry incessantly and scream in despair. Images of the Middle East, pay attention to mainstream media, and I'm not talking about today, I'm talking about years and years, decades. Images of the Middle East represent exactly that. You will very, very seldom see on mainstream media Middle Easterners that are sitting and talking and doing things that I guess uh, normally people do. It's always about this. They're very mysterious, they're very violent, and, and what do we need to do, and this is the message, go to their aid, be there present so we can help them through this, uh, through all of these conflicts and problems. So now, I want you to take a look at the way we militarize the Middle East. Um, from mid-1980s to 2008, Military sales to the Middle East increased from 48% to 78% of all U.S. arm exports in the world. That is, 78% of our exporting arms, military equipment, goes to the same region that we think has the gravest problem with violence and conflict. It just doesn't make any sense for you to send more arms to a region where you think violence is a problem. It's like having a few criminals, murderers, and arming them to go at, it, each, at each other and expecting, you know, civilized outcomes. It just doesn't happen. If you, if you are a believer, if we are a believer that people in the Middle East are violent, they're conflictual, they don't understand democracy, why would you send more arms to the region? It's, it's a very simple thing. And I think even a 12-year-old can discern and, and analyze. You just don't do anything like that. However, if you look at the trend of our uh, arms exports to the Middle East, it's increased incessantly. U.S. sales in the Middle East and clients accounted for 76% of its total arms sales since 1999, and about the same percentage of all sales to the region in that period. This reminds me of, a, of an, another example. Um, George Bush, before he left office, I think it was 2007, so a year before he left office, he, he struck a deal with the GCC, Gulf uh, Countries Corporation, which is basically five countries. It's the Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, 
um, and Kuwait, right? They purchase these five countries. Go look up their history. They've never been in war, ever. These five countries purchased $67 billion worth of arms from the U.S. So why would you have the five countries that are in the region, in the Gulf region, that have never been in war, you know, peaceful uh, with their neighbors, purchase $67 billion worth of arms? Again, something that just doesn't make any sense. Of course, and I'm not saying that officials from Qatar and Bahrain and, and the Emirates and Kuwait and Saudi Arabia don't have justification for this. They, I'm sure they do, and I've you know, read their justification. And I'm not saying that the U.S. foreign policy has no justification for this. We do. However, if you read and discern that, you'll see that it doesn't make much sense in, again, sending that kind of arms to, to a region that's full of conflict. Between 2002 and 2008, the military budget, not including appropriations for Iraq and Afghanistan, has increased by more than $600 billion cumulatively. We spend $85 billion today, $85 billion a year in Afghanistan. You ask anybody, why are we there? They couldn't tell you. Um, we can let you guys, students in America, go to state schools like FIU for free, graduate with $64 billion. So the money we spend in Afghanistan in one year, $85 billion, $84, $85 billion, can send all of you to college for free if you go to state school, not, not private school. And, and then go look at how useful we are. Look at, I mean, read Defense Department reports. I don't mean read my reports or some kind of a you know, conspiracy of, or anything, some kind of an alternative news report. Read Defense Department's reports. Read State Department's reports. Read Pentagon reports, White House reports, any report you like about what we are accomplishing in Afghanistan and what we have accomplished in Afghanistan since October of 2001 when we went to Afghanistan. So it's been 15 years, almost. And read what we have done in 15 years in Afghanistan. Continuously, up to about $3 trillion we have spent in Afghanistan and see what they say about what we have accomplished. You will see that not much. I, <laughs> I don't know if I should give out this kind of information, but I've been contacted because I do research on the Middle East and I speak some of the languages there and I also uh, have written about it. I've been contacted by some private contractors to be sent to Afghanistan so this is, this is recent, right, after 14, 15 years. And I say, why do you need researchers to go to Afghanistan? And the answer was, we want to understand the culture there. After 15 years of conflict, you know, this kind of spending, all of that, now we want to understand the culture there. And still, I don't know the point. I mean, what is the point of understanding the culture? Yeah, okay, they have a culture. This is how they live. And so what is it that we need to do over there? Why are we spending... 84, 85 billion dollars a year. Military sales in the Middle East. In 2003, 72% of US foreign aid allotted for the Middle East was used for military purposes, and as opposed to 28% of economic development. Again, 28%, a region that's full of conflict and violence. We say 72% of our aid is for your militarism, and only 28% of our aid is for their uh, economic development. $3.8 billion in military aid is well over 90% of what the U.S. Uh, gives to the entire world. So look at that. I mean, look at the proportion of what we give and how much of it goes to the military as opposed to the rest of the world. In 2001, more than half of the world's total purchase of arms from the U.S. went to the Middle East, totaling $6.1 billion. And I gave you the example of the GCC, which is $67 billion, which really overshadows this number of $6 billion. Since 1992, the U.S. arms exports to the Middle East totaled $90 billion, more than all other countries combined. Again, a region that's so volatile gets all of that military equipment. 
Center for Defense Information says that in the five years after September 11th, total U.S. arms sales to 25 countries, mostly in the Middle East region, were worth four times more than those concluded in the five years prior to September 11th. And these countries received 18 times more total U.S. military assistance after September 11th. So 72% of the countries in this in the series received more military assistance, and 64% conducted more arms sales with the U.S. during the five years after September 11th than during the entire period between uh, 1990 and 2001. The cost of war, and again, this is the Iraq War has been going on another failure, according to the Defense Department, not me, according to the Pentagon. The Iraq War has been going on since March 19th of 2003, right, about 13 years. And the Afghanistan War has been going on since October of 2001, so 15 years. Um, so trillions of dollars of spending uh, in both of these wars. And read reports. Who is winning? Who is the victor here? And do we have conclusive uh, policy, or do we have anything that we want to implement in Iraq and Afghanistan after all of these years? Do we know what we're doing? You'll notice how Congress and the President and the President and other politicians are constantly talking about, should we stay longer? Should we come out? Should we you know, leave some military bases? How many? It's always this question of what, what can we do to justify our presence there. It's never, why are we here to begin with? And why does the U.S. need to be here in the Middle East uh, to the point where we're afraid of the consequences of these damn terrorists coming over here and killing us? So if you look at these reasonings, these, these, the ways that we reason, it just doesn't add up. According to National Priorities Project, the cost of two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been one in three trillion dollars. This is an old number, so it's probably way more now. Lawrence Corb says, this is a quotation, the Raptor, the F-22, Lockheed Martin product, which cost $360 million each, was the most unnecessary weapon system being built by the Pentagon. And look at what we are doing. This is a lot of information, but I really need to read it to you uh, because it, it just does not, according to what I've read, make any sense. After 9-11, many of the unnecessary products, like the F-22, were revived. The B-2 bomber at the cost of $1.2 billion. Every time a B-2 bomber drops a bomb, it's $1 million. One bomb, $1 million. The bomber was originally designed to penetrate the Soviet air system, a tactic that became useless with the end of the Cold War, 1992. It was, in fact, tested for the first time in the summer of 1989, coinciding with the end of the Cold War, almost, at least Eastern Europe. However, after the declaration of war on terrorists was abruptly found useful, the B-2 was designed to avoid sophisticated defense system like the Soviets and not of the Taliban, ISIS, or ISIL, or Al-Qaeda. It, 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 it's like going to war against Al-Qaeda with a submarine. I don't remember or don't re recall the time when Al-Qaeda had scuba divers or terrorists that came from underwater. The Virginia-class attack submarine, the cost of $2.5 billion each. And the Boeing V-22 Osprey, tilt rotor aircraft that combines the vertical takeoff and landing of a helicopter. You've probably seen those jet fighters that take off um, vertically. The plane's production continues at the cost of $55 billion. In October 2001, Lockheed Martin was given a contract by the Pentagon for what became a $300 billion project to construct F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, a multi-service combat plane. All of them, these are jet fighters that were useful during the Cold War, and nothing to do with terrorism, and the way that terrorists actually fight. Right, this is my conclusion. I'm going to talk a little bit more after the conclusion, and then we'll get to sort of some kind of a discussion, hopefully, uh, and questions, because uh, I think that's the part that I like the most, some kind of a free-floating discussion. One can conclu conclude 
from such foreign policy that the U.S. neglects to pay attention to real causes of conflict, and we'll talk about that uh, in the Middle East. By continu continuing its policy of militarization and war, U.S. foreign policy has for decades proven to fail continuously. It is the only policy that maintains the status quo in a volatile region, status quo being conflict that's going on. If you look at the Middle East, this conflict that existed 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, is still the same kind of a conflict. Uh, it is the only policy that maintains the status quo in a volatile region that seems to intervene, invade, I'm sorry, to fail continuously, to verge of exp uh, explosion. The more conflict, the more reason for the U.S. to intervene, invade, occupy, change regimes, build bases, export experts, arm the goods versus the evil, and support despots. Stability and democracy in the Middle East would render the U.S. involvement obsolete. So my argument is this. If you know, our contention is always we're bringing democracy to the Middle East. We're bringing stability to the Middle East. I believe if there is stability in the Middle East and democracy in the Middle East, the first thing they would ask of us is to leave. That is, so we no longer need you here. We're stable, we're democratic. And then that would be a problem for us because so now how are we going to justify? So I don't think we're really wanting to contribute to that kind of stability because the first thing that happens is for us to have to leave. So this is a little bit of politics. Republican, I, this is what I believe for the, go check their foreign policy for the past 50 years. Both Republican and Democratic parties continue to finance the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan as well as the Department of Defense. Bellicosity has been, unfortunately, bipartisan. So, which means that both parties have contributed. Go look at their voting record. Go look at how much money they think should be uh, given to this war in the Middle East, to the conflict in the Middle East, to the military, and so on. And you'll see that they're both, both parties are as bellicose as the other. That is, they both want war and they're all warlike uh, because the Middle East requires that kind of a military attention. I don't mind getting into the question because this is a controversial issue. And again, in conferences with my own colleagues, I've always had uh, a lot of discussions about this. And unfortunately, when I talk to other professors, what I get, and this is, this is the, like the content and the nature of our conversation. What I get from them is the same thing that is on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, ABC, CBS, NBC. So this is what I have to tell these professors, right, my colleagues. You are now done with telling me what CNN thinks. Can you now tell me what you think? That is, you know, so yeah, that I can turn the TV on or turn the TV on and, and watch CNN. What you just told me, you've heard from CNN. Now tell me, you as a professor, who is a thinker, thinks about what's going on in the Middle East. And there is silence. No ideas of my own do I have about what's going on in the Middle East. It's everything. You know, these guys over there don't know what to do. You know, we have to show them democracy. Obviously, they don't like each other. And obviously, like Zinni said, uh, for the Middle East, it's, it's just the way, it's natural to be savage. Even if you read somebody like uh, Lewis Kozer, um, who, who writes about the Middle East, you'll read that, I'm sorry, Bernard Lewis. He writes in the Orientalist fashion. He thinks that it is completely necessary for the West to go and teach the Muslims and the Arabs and the Middle Easterners about how to get along, about democracy, about modernity. So it's our obligation to do that. So from the philosophical perspective, all the way to the military perspective, we're attacking or looking at the Middle East as if this is this one big enigmatic project that we have that we need to figure out the solution. Because the people over there themselves can't come up with the solution. Because you know they, have, they don't have, by nature, the capability of doing something like that. So uh, let me take some questions and some comments. Uh, yes. Describing the Middle East is insanity. Is insanity. 
doing the same thing over and over again expecting a different result. Now, um, you said also the GCC buys billions and billions of weapons that they never get to war. But if you look across the fate of Hormuz, you have Iran who's building nuclear uh, reactors and hopes to develop a nuclear weapon, and these states are trying to defend themselves for possible Iran aggression. Which uh, currently. Yeah, that's CNN. Yeah, well. <laughs> Anyways, so the Middle East conflict. But what I'm saying is, where is, where is, the, where is the evidence? Evidence of that. Yeah. Where evidence of what? The nuclear reactors? That Iran is building a nuclear. That's the intelligence. That's something that the intelligence department. That's something the intelligence department is, is in charge of. I'm not an intelligence expert. I just know that because of the secretary of violence and the reason between the Shias and Muslims, it's quite clear that Iran will seek nuclear weapons to Iran. Th threaten, yeah, to threaten, okay. to threaten the stability in the region, which it has been doing for a long time. Well, look, the Sunni and the Shia problem doesn't exist. It's the same as the Catholic and the Protestant problem. It does exist, however if political power is assigned to them. But the, the, the British who were Protestants were killing the Irish who were Catholic. Had nothing to do with the religion. But they took sides as religion. So the, the Sunni Shia divide? Go ask a Sunni in the Middle East, not here. To ask a Sunni, what is the main difference between you and Shia? They won't be able to tell you, basically. Basically, they won't be able to tell you. Sunnis and Shias intermarried, went to the same mosque, got along just fine, before the assignment of political power. As soon as you get political power, now you have conflict. That's as simple as it is. Sunnis and go before, you know, into the 40s, 50s, 60s, a thousand years ago. Show me the conflict between Sunnis and Shias. I mean, it's currently happening right now. And currently, yes, because there's political power assigned to the other. Exactly. Which explains why both countries, I mean, the, the GCC will bust up its military capabilities to counter the Shia dominance in the region or attempt to dominate the region. Again, yeah, it's a, it's that's a why we have Shia dominance. Okay, you can have some ideas. What was the. Was the general um, I'll take us up. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Evelyn. I'm an undergrad here. I think from all I've understood, uh, from your presentation is that we're still in conflict right now with people that we don't understand. So my question is, what is the next step that we can take to make sure this conflict is ended within, within, I don't know, something reasonable, the next year, the next two years, or something? Us as students, what can we do to help this stop now? The real fundamental answer to your question, which is a really good question, is as students, as Americans, as somebody who's concerned, it is to demand that our military at least, and politics and economics and other things, our military at least believe. Um, every time I watch these debates about, you just called it this conflict, or whatever conflict, there's millions of conflicts in, in the Middle East, there's Iraq, there's Afghanistan, there's Iran, there's Palestine, and Israel, there's Egypt, and all kinds of, right? All of these conflicts. Every time I see a panel of experts come together. The only one thing they don't talk about is, what are we doing there? And why don't we leave? That's the one thing that... So my answer to your question, which is very fundamental, is we need to leave. And let these... I don't know, these people kill each other. It's none of our business. But that's not going to happen because we justify a whole lot of political, economic, and military intrusion through this kind of conflict. So yes, your job is to demand that we leave. So I mean, OK, we leave. But we've already been in this conflict for a while now. And it, throughout history, every time we get involved with something, we just leave.
in a lot of cases, they leave behind the infrastructure to continue the conflicts between each other. Like, we leave behind weaponry, we leave behind, you know, other dangerous things. And they get their hands on it, and then they use it against each other. Sure, sure. But at some point during the war, war in Iraq, we lost 100,000 Asian forces. Whoa. We lost. Wow. We lost 100,000 Asian forces. Yeah, guess where that ends up? We lost it. So that's just that's just Iraq. But but, but again, the, the solution is for us not to be there. That, that's what I think. If you want to theoretically stretch that kind of a thinking system, that is, we think here in the, let's say, when, uh, when um, who's your friendly neighbor in Venezuela? Chavez. When Chavez was alive, right, George Bush was, had 27% job approval here in the U.S. He was doing really bad. Through the stretching of this theory, Chavez had good reason to militarily invade the U.S. because he thought Americans are not satisfied with their government. Right? This, this theory that we go and invade countries where people are not satisfied with their government. Where do you get that? But where do you get this justification that we have to get involved? Is that, you know, recall what happened in Iraq. First, it was the weapons of mass destruction. Oops, we didn't find any. Then it was the tie between al-Qaeda and Saddam. Oops, we can't establish that. Then it's, we need to establish democracy here. Why is it your business to establish democracy, you know, halfway around the world? Just like, how is it Chavez's problem to come and establish a good government here when George Bush has, you know, terrible disapproval. Yes. I mean, so then their involvement would mean they would have some interest or some assets to, to protect. Who's they? I'm sorry. They as in uh, U.S. involvement in just, like, global, where, they, where you said they don't have to be, you know. I'm just saying, why, if, if, if the solution ultimately is to leave, but our president is still there. Anyway, like you mean politically and economically? Right. I, mean, I think I think that would come second and third. But mm -hmm. I think what's most necessary, according to what I just showed you, militarily speaking, a lot of the violence comes with the killing, right, and the militarism. I think if that's not available, right, if this kind of an armed export to the Middle East is not available, at some point they would have to see. Right? It will get gradually lesser and lesser and lesser. So, yeah, the political and the economic problem will come after that. So they'll say, we don't want you here politically either. Okay, bye. We don't want you here economically e either. All right, bye. But let's negotiate. Right. That's okay. I can understand that. But the military stuff is, I think, the first thing that needs to go. Why? No one's been able to answer this here. This is a volatile region full of conflict. People are violent. They're just savages. Why do we still send 78% of our armed exports to that region? Instead of get involved in you know, the political and economic stuff, right? The cultural stuff. Why don't we do that? This presentation is basically America depends on proper uh, arms. Basically, it's our main number one industry. If anybody want to touch that, it's the truth. We depend on arms. The second thing, Saudi Arabia is a big player in that region. Also. It has Wahhabism, and I don't think people have seen that Wahhabism is not even rival. The story is the whole region. Second of all, our involvement in the Middle East involves also controlling media here. We cannot, um, people cannot go, we cannot, what she said, that we can, nobody can criticize going us going to the Middle East because it will be anti-American in a time of war. Because we have, uh, Paris has been attacked and we have to keep up to right. here and we have to be secure. So there's many two things. And the other thing is that we, we rely on intelligence, which is false. False intelligence that CNN, Fox, nobody really knows what's happening in the end of the world. And when you see other alternative things, you the public considers that as conspiracy and that's a lie and that's that's alternative. It, it's not right. So what I basically see is like a fog of war. You know, I think America's in a fog of war and 
Yeah. It's losing influence, not in the sense of what Americans stand for, but for what it's doing. It's supposed to be doing something rather not bombing, shouldn't be bombing to get democracy, because when you're bombing these kids, these kids are growing up, it's like a hybrid. You cut a head, three more girls. So uh, uh, you see this, this girl, the Malala, I don't know what her name, Malala, she even says it like, by us going abroad and bombing these kids, these kids are growing up to hate us. So it's a conflict. Uh, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. This is uh, also a response to. Just left, but I don't know if you know Joe Wilson. Joe Wilson used to be the ambassador in uh, Niger, and uh, the Bush administration, because Valerie Plame, who was his wife, wanted to know how much yellow cake Saddam has purchased from Niger, uh, which was a producer of. So they get Joe Wilson, because he was familiar uh, with the region, to go to Niger and find out when and how much Saddam Hussein purchased yellow cake. And so he goes there, he talks to a few people, and he finds out that no, no such purchase has actually taken place. So, and he was sent by the CIA, by the way. Um, he goes down there, no purchase whatsoever. He comes back to report to the CIA and then therefore the White House that, this is 2002, right, late 2002, that there has been no such purchase. He comes home, sits down, turns the TV on. Our government is already announcing that Saddam Hussein has purchased yellow cake from Niger, right? So, you know, he gets the information from the, I know it's intelligence, but mind you, the same organization that is the CIA, three years later, reported that we know that there has been no, per after the war had started already, after we had mobilized the whole thing, after everything was done with, now the CIA says, yeah, there was no purchase of yellow cake. And this was true three years ago when Joe Wilson came back from Niger, was about to tell you, that uh, I don't know if you know, but Joe Wilson actually got really mad and he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying that you know, these guys were waiting, were supposed to be waiting for my news, but here they are already announcing that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. And of course, we know that he did it. So I know you get these reports that Iran is about to bomb Saudi Arabia and the GCC. And that's, you know, think about it. it you know, you, you can go and read and see how much truth is behind that. Yes. disagree that it's as simple as just pulling out of these areas because you have to recognize all the consequences that would happen if we just pulled out so then all of our allies get killed and people don't trust us in the future. There are huge foreign policy disasters potentially there. And uh, yes, I mean, that is, that is something that you need to acknowledge. And um, on top of that, uh, you know, allowing the Taliban to re-establish and take over these areas, I, I don't think that's a good thing either. I think those are both big problems that would happen if we just pulled everyone out. Right, I'm, not, so I'm not a pro-war person, but you haven't really addressed that. All right, so uh, I will address it. Tell me what you mean. You know, if we just, you say, just let them kill each other. So, you know, they're, they're countries so that we're allied with and we just, you know, let them, we don't come to their defense. And, so tell me who the ally is. I don't know. I'm thinking, like, first of all, we, of course, help out our allies in the GCC. Are you talking about the government of the five countries? Yeah. I mean, all right, so we look, support let's them. say we no longer. Like, and then there's, like, the Israel conflict. That's a huge issue, too. I mean. Right. Oh, that, it's, it's actually a very good example of what I just said, Israel mm -hmm. and Palestine. But look, let's, let's talk about our ally and that if we leave, they're now in danger. This is exactly what I'm talking about. If the population in Qatar and Bahrain and the Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait are angry with their government, which is possible in the world of politics all the time, you know, read 2,000 years of history, we need to allow that population to confront their government on their own terms. Right? How is it our... How is it, and this is what's happening, but now we go and keep these dictators, he said, the Wahhabis, 
we allow these dictators, because they're our allies, to remain in power. Yeah. I'm from a country, Iran, who democratically elected, democra voted for a prime minister, and then the CIA, through a coup, took him out of office and put in a dictator. You're saying we should allow that to remain. Not really. I just think that they're wrong. Simple as the things that you're saying are the best idea. Like, I, just, I don't think you're really recognizing a lot of the negatives. Right, so look, that's why I want you to articulate. When you say our ally, if you tell me who you mean, then I'll tell you these are the what? You know, at the cost of what? If the dictatorship in Saudi Arabia, go read, they don't even have a constitution. This is what they claim. We're a bunch of men who want to rule 29 million people. If that's, that's our ally, right? And we want to repress you and suppress you, and all the money belongs to us. If that's a government that's dictating over a population that's got discontent, by all means, it should be overthrown. That's, and that's the process of conflict between a population and its state. Look, if we want to vote Bernie Sanders in, or Trump in, right? That's our, that's our problem, or our solution. Do you think that another country has the right to come over and say, no, 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 that's a bad, bad idea. We, we're not going to allow you to do that. That's not a good idea, because we want to choose, I don't know, Trump, Hillary, whoever. They're sovereign countries. They're right, sovereign. they're sovereign countries. Yes. That, you know, at least theoretically. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you think just, if the Taliban just, you know, we just left and like let them completely take over and, you know... We put, in the, the, women, the, we okay. put the Taliban in power in 1996. Okay, but since when we... Okay, but that doesn't... <laughs> Go look at... I the understand Taliban that, but that doesn't, visited. obviously we've been fighting against allowing them to take over since then. Well, let me give you yeah. some bad news. We are now, at the consultation of the Defense Department and CIA, involving the Taliban to get to get to become part of the government in Afghanistan. I really believe that if we just pull everything out, that things will be okay. I just think that's the most naive idea. Yeah, but it won't be... It won't be worse than what's going on today. I promise really? you. I, don't think so. I promise. I don't know. Um, yeah. Just, just. I, I, have, I know what you're saying. For example, once you invade a country, especially on a massive scale, as the United States did, um, it's our responsibility that once we leave that country, to get it back, to get it back to how it was, or, or better. Because, because what I tell what's you, an example of that? Example of, of what? Of what? what you mean of, the thing is, I think it's unethical to to go into a country. Destroy all its infrastructure that Iraq has ha, had, and then and it's just and, and leave, you know. And also the thing about the allies, our allies are the people who all help us when I, when we got there. For example, the translators of our first work with the military that that we that when we first went in to translate documents and stuff like that. Once once the the translator um, was the translator um, business was done, a lot of those, a lot of those same translators tried to apply for a visa to go back to the United States because they're right. coming family. They're family back in Iraq. Right. So that's what I mean, that lady means. That we have a responsibility to, to protect our allies that first helped us initially yeah, to go into the war. To the war. And and I, I was against the war in the first place. But I think once we make a commitment to destroy everyone's infrastructure, we can't just call it one day, all right, guys, we messed up your whole country, we're going to leave. Yeah, all right, bye. bye. You get, I think you have to go. And also, you have to understand the future repercussions that has. Because what happens, the United States, now the United States in the world has a, a position that, okay, these people will one day go into the country and leave out of nowhere. And we can't have that as a future generation. Like, okay, this is what they do. This is what their game plan is. Yeah, it's if you were, if you were, if you, during the, what I was talking about, it, exactly what you're, what you're alluding to. That is, look, um, it would be great if we stayed and took care of things, right? And didn't all of a sudden leave. That would be great. But here's my contention. It is not in our foreign policy's nature to do that. It is in the nature of our foreign policy to create conflict and not the opposite of that. Because, again, if you remember what I was saying, with stability, right, we're staying there in Iraq to create stable conditions. Good? No, we, we should worry about it. With stability, we are useless. With conflict, we're useful. 
I mean, look, I understand. Your intentions are great. They're the same as mine. Don't destroy things and just leave. Good. But is it in your nature to stay here after you destroy things? So think about why did we destroy to begin with. And is it in your nature to now create stability? The same cause. Do you understand the tautology in that? You want the destroyer to now build. It's not in the nature of the destroyer to now build and create stability. I agree with you 100%. But that's not the nature of our foreign policy. Do you think industrial military industrial complex that has something to do with that with a destroyer mentality? That that push and push and push and promote the act of war? Yeah, they're they're strong. The, the, the least I can say is that they're strong. Okay. And, and so they push a lot of their own agenda. For entertainment's sake, not because I'm right, for entertainment's sake, go look up the profits of defense contracting in the past 15 years, just to be entertained, you know. You know, I'm going to go to a party and talk about this kind of thing. <laughs> Not for academic purposes. You will be amazed at the profits they're making. Then backtrack that how much of that profit has to do with the Middle East. The, the least I can say is that they're very strong. And I, you know, I don't buy necessarily this idea that the military industrial complex has taken over the government or anything like that. But when it, com but when it comes to militarism, it certainly has a strong word. That's what I think. Yes. The, there is profit in war. The world will never know peace. But that is not my question. That's like a, something that I read. Uh, why we have to be the police of the world? Uh, there is an issue in Afghanistan, let's say, uh, about the dancing boys. You know yeah. what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. Why it is that we have to teach them how to live if they, if that's their culture, and we don't abolish that practice, which is. Uh, horrific to me. Yeah. Right. There was a, a deal between one of our presidents, U.S. presidents, with uh, uh, with the Saudi Arabia uh, Saudi Arab prince, long, long, long time ago. I don't know if that was Goodrow Wilson. The the the, the deal was uh, basically we both help each other. We both, you know, you profit out of our oil and you don't mess with our culture, with our uh, right. religion. So it seems to be that they didn't do all the all those uh, uh, I mean that uh, deal with all those Middle Eastern countries because I, I don't see them messing with our, Saudi Arabia. I, I agree with you 100 percent going back to the sort of original statement you made. Uh, we are acting in the Middle East even worse than the policemen of the Middle East. They're actually involved. Uh, but let me just give you one little tiny fact. <coughs> Our military budget equals the rest of the world's military budget. Mm -hmm. We are 50% of the world's military budget. 49% right? So, and then we are the people who say, negotiate in peaceful means. You know, conflict is bad. Peace is good. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, right? We, we talk about that all the time. Yes. Why would we spend $1.1 trillion on the military? Am I going to take your words for what I know about you, or am I going to take a look at what you're doing to understand you? And I, and I agree with you. The Taliban were put into power by us in 1996. So, you know, why we students are, don't really understand, like, they just hear the these blanket statements, and they're like, the U.S. created the Taliban. Oh, so there's plenty, of books, how you plenty of books written about that. Please, Thank, yes, please uh, tell me specifically uh, why you believe that. Because, because they were the ones who were fighting against the, the Soviets. I know all of that story. I know right, how so we, we trained them to help. But we did not, like, start, we did not, like, support their ideals and their, like, crazy nonsense. Do we, Sorry. All right, we, do we support the ideals of the Wahhabis? Professor. Professor. Wait, 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 wait. I just can't stand The Wahhabis the are the same thing. Do we support them? The answer is we don't support their values, but we want to damn sure, make damn sure that they stay in power. The same thing with the Taliban. Go look up the look at the footage. They were in fact visiting with with uh, Texas. Right. When 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 they when they, when they had so nineteen ninety six, come into power, we don't care about your values. Two thousand one, oh no, you're no good. Go away because your values suck. 
2014, can you come back to the negotiating table and be part of the government? Which one should I adhere to? I mean, are they good? Are they bad? Do we like them? Are they, I don't know. Do you understand that there is no fundamental reason why we either go at somebody or not go at somebody? You can't, you cannot tell me that there is one reason. I use the same thing with illicit, illicit drugs. One reason why this drug is illicit, one reason why this drug is illicit, you can't come up with that one reason, even one reason. You cannot come up with one reason that this is why we conduct our foreign policy in the Middle East that way. There's just no one reason. We're all over the place. We like dictators. Sometimes we, we take them out. Sometimes it it's just doesn't make any sense. A lot of it has to do, if you want to make sense of it, is what I'm talking about. Our presence there creates the conflict. The, the conflict there requires our presence. Yes. So you say these conflicts were beginning like 15-ish years ago. So 20 years ago, weren't Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and their families uh, allied with the United no, States? No, no. This is even rejected by 14 different organizations that worked with the, the department. Uh, Saddam Hussein was an atheist, almost socialist. Couldn't stand fundamentalists. Osama bin Laden was a fundamentalist who had different agendas. To put them together, you know what that does, what that shows me when, when some, I, I heard on CNN, there's been reason, there's been proof that Saddam Hussein is working with Al-Qaeda. I said, you only have to be ignorant about these two people to believe something like that. If you know Saddam Hussein and his, his, his history, and you know uh, uh, Osama and his history, and his values, it's just no, no possible, possible way to put these people together. So yeah, they use our ignorance because we don't know the Sunni and the Shia have been fighting each other for 14, that's not true. But they construct that to be true and then we end up believing it.